So today's webinar will be on summertime household pests, and it's presented by Dr. Andrew Sutherland. Andrew is an area urban IPM advisor for the San Francisco Bay Area. He was UCANR's first cooperative extension advisor tasked with addressing urban pests, both structural and industrial, and serving urban pest management professionals. His program helps develop new and evaluate existing IPM strategies and tactics for key urban pests. As an entomologist, his focus is on urban insect pests, including bedbugs, termites, and cockroaches. And I will hand it over to you. Thank you for joining us, Andrew. All right, you guys can see me, hear me okay? Yep. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation. Looks good? Yep. Okay, thanks Lauren for the introduction. Thanks everyone for participating in today's webinar. So our title here is Household Pests in the Summertime. And um, I have two images here on this title slide that remind me of the scope of the presentation. So household, we're talking about pests within the home, but also around the home. And that's important because um, most pests uh, around the home may sometimes get in. Um, so we're talking in the home and around the home. And then I have an image of the East Bay uh, Hills in the summertime. And you notice everything's dry. So that's going to be a common theme in this presentation. We have a very unique climate. We have a Mediterranean climate here in California. And it certainly affects the way that uh, insects and other animals live their seasonal lives. And so the seasonal pests that we're going to discuss today are very much impacted by this uh, very dry landscape. OK, who am I? As mentioned, I'm the Urban Integrated Pest Management Advisor for the San Francisco Bay Area. I work primarily with urban pest management professionals. So these may include pest control, government agencies, school districts, housing districts, vector control districts, really anybody who's managing pests as part of their job. And uh, my program aims to improve pest control through research and education. And of course, the goal there uh, or the the um, you know the point of all that is to protect our communities and the environment through the process. I'm going to put this slide first so that I don't forget about it. Um, I am selling a wonderful, beautiful poster, Common Cockroaches of California. It's two feet by three feet, full color, glossy, fifteen dollars, and so um, it could be a great addition to your garage, uh, living room, kitchen, training room. Um, I'm kind of kidding a little bit, but it is a wonderful poster. So keep that in mind. The proceeds benefit my program directly. What are we going to talk about today? First, I'll have a slide or two about urban IPM. Some of you may know that IPM is an agricultural concept. So uh, how do we apply that in urban systems? Why is it important to apply the concepts of IPM in urban systems? Then we're gonna focus on uh, some common summertime pests that we see here in California, uh, spending the most time on what we call peridomestic cockroaches. These are the cockroaches that live around your home. They don't live and breed in the home, but they get in. So we'll talk about how that happens, why that happens, and how to prevent uh, that occurrence. Then we'll talk about ants and really ant invasions, uh, which can be common during the summer. And there'll be some brief mentions of some other pests. Throughout the webinar, I hope to share various resources that are available through UC's Integrated Pest Management Program. Okay, so IPM, in a nutshell, is about managing pests while minimizing negative impacts of pest management. We have to manage the pest because a pest by definition uh, provides some uh, negative impact on 
uh, people or their properties um, or um, you know other assets that we're managing. So some of these pests actually threaten our health, you know, public health, community health. They may bite us, they may sting us, they may make us sick. Others are attacking our wooden structures like termites or wood boring beetles. And uh, still others are attacking the plants that are in our gardens, landscapes, and even natural areas. So that's the negative aspect of the pest. But when we choose to manage pests, we may be producing negative impacts on the environment as well as on the community. And so IPM seeks to balance all that and minimize uh, the negative impacts that are uh, created. And within IPM, we have a series of steps or central tenants, if you will, and they're stepwise. You know, so we start at the top, we learn about the pest we're battling, perhaps about its life cycle, perhaps about points in that life cycle that we can focus on or attack in our management program. Next, we think about prevention. How can we prevent these pests from ever being a problem? And that's important because if the pest never occurs, we don't have to manage it. So prevention should always come first in IPM before other management tactics are considered. Monitoring, what does that mean? In IPM systems, we need to know, is the pest present or absent? Are the numbers increasing or decreasing? And um, this is not done as often as it should be. Uh, for some pests, we have very good, very specific monitoring tools that are underutilized. There's also a concept tied in with monitoring, and that's thresholds. When do we take action? How many ants is too many ants? And the interesting thing in urban systems is the threshold may not be economic. Um, in agriculture, this threshold concept is usually tied to economics. Are we going to lose money on our crop? Uh, or are we even going to be able to sell the crop? In urban systems, we may be thinking about tolerance thresholds. We may be talking about aesthetic thresholds. And so the threshold can be somewhat subjective. In all cases, when we reach our threshold, we take action. We use multiple tactics. So we're not relying on uh, biological control or pesticides or physical removal. We're trying to integrate multiple tactics and therefore we will be more effective uh, with that collection of tactics. The tactics are integrated, so they do not interfere. And then, of course, we evaluate the program. So professionals use this process. Uh, you can, too, at your home, uh, in your community, at your place of business. All right. So I'll step off of the IPM soapbox and start talking um, about pests. First, uh, let's remember the scope. We're talking about summertime, which hasn't technically begun. I think next week is uh, the summer solstice. And in a Mediterranean climate like California, summertime is characterized by almost no water. I'm from Florida where it rains every day in the summer, pretty much. And so my mom will visit me and she'll see something like the image here on top. And she'll say, son, why is everything dead? Uh, well, it's because we ain't got no water in the summertime, Mom. Um, we also uh, have very warm or even hot temperatures. And because uh, we're in the summer uh, season, very long days. So a lot of time for things to dry out. So that's the trend throughout the landscape. Everything is losing water. What little water is available is scarce, hard to access maybe toxic because of buildup of salt and other uh, uh, compounds. And so every organism is, um, you know, conserving water, searching for water, modifying its behavior to access water. Household pests, as mentioned in this presentation, are going to um, be those living inside and those living immediately surrounding residential buildings. Okay, now if you look at the UCIPM website, 
we've got a list of different pests that are covered and there's so many of them. And many of them do have population increases in the summer just because there's uh, longer days, warmer temperatures. If we're talking about insects, the developmental time period is shorter. So we have faster generation times. Um, and so there are a lot of these that you may consider to be summertime pests. I'm gonna talk about a few that really have pronounced population increases or uh, pest situations like structural invasions that occur in the summer. So we're gonna start with peridomestic cockroaches. So cockroaches can be loosely divided into domestic and peridomestic if we're talking about pest cockroaches. We also have what are called sylvatic cockroaches that live in the forest, in the landscape. They don't bother anybody, but the pests fall into either domestic or peridomestic. Domestic cockroaches live and breed inside our homes and structures. Peridomestic cockroaches cannot survive inside. They live around the structure or maybe under the structure in infrastructure and they periodically get in. And so it's kind of um, a, a nuisance pest rather than a public health pest like some of the domestic cockroaches. In this example, I'm showing you uh, Turkestan cockroaches and we'll do some species accounts here in a second. And the Turkestan cockroaches live and breed in the crevices that we find in hardscapes uh, or in moist areas of the landscape uh, or subsurface. So storm drain systems, water meter boxes, other utility boxes. And they're happy out there in the landscape. They are omnivores. They're eating all kinds of decaying matter, plant matter as well as animal matter. Um, but they start to search uh, especially in the summer, as they reach maturity, they're searching for water, they're searching for food, and they're searching for places to get out of, um, you know, really hot and in, inhospitable conditions. So, in the top left, you see a crevice in a sidewalk where the cockroaches are breeding. They're depositing their egg cases there. So the lower left, you see an accumulation of egg cases. We call them Oothaki, and each one of these can have 16 or with some species, even more eggs within that case. The cockroaches are looking around for food and water. And if your structure is not well sealed, like in the lower right, this is an exterior door, they can walk right underneath. So when you find these large, scary cockroaches inside, they're not living and breeding inside usually, they're coming in through a poorly sealed structure. So when I first moved to California, I encountered oriental cockroaches. And these are also found in Florida, but they're not as common. Uh, when I was in Davis, California, we would see these um, regularly skittering around the sidewalks on a warm night. Uh, they live and breed in dark, damp, outdoor locations. And um, for some reason, perhaps because of their preference for damp, uh, locales, people in California call them water bugs. They're not bugs, they're cockroaches. The female, which you see on the top right of this uh, family portrait, is um, wingless um, and usually black or dark brown. The male on the lower left has reduced wings, so the wings do not cover the entire abdomen. And then the nymphs can vary in size and color depending on their age. Recently, we have had a lot more experience with a relative newcomer, uh, the Turkestan cockroach. Now, these guys are related to oriental cockroaches, and the ecology is almost the same. The difference is they are uh, better adapted to arid conditions, so they can survive uh, very well in California um, when there's not much water. They are currently considered the most common peridomestic species in the American Southwest. And that includes Southern California, the Central Valley, and then parts of uh, the Bay Area that are warmer. So I think in Sacramento right now, um, 
Bakersfield, all the way up to Redding, this may be the most common species that we're seeing outside. And so you may see these guys um, stuck, if you are doing monitoring, um, inside. You know, these are oriental cockroaches here. So um, this was in a garage, this particular sticky card. But, you know, this is evidence that the cockroaches are getting in. So cards like this, sticky cards like this, can be used to answer that question. How are they getting in? Um, and usually it's an exterior door, garage door. Uh, sometimes a poorly sealed window, but these cockroaches are not great climbers. Um, they're usually getting in from the ground. So let's see, here's a little video. Shows a typical habitat, you know, so the, here we have um, irrigation uh, valve ports and um, very nice and moist. So it's good if they stay there, but what we don't want to happen is this. We have an exterior door that's poorly sealed and that's um, a super highway for these cockroaches to get in. We also want to understand the generalized life cycle of these guys in California. Right now is mating season. So you may see something like this. Uh, this is a male Turkestan and female Turkestan cockroach, clearly in love. And um, they're joined in copulation. Eggs come next. So if you are looking to manage a population of Turkestan cockroaches, now's the time. If you wait too long, uh, the ootheki, the egg cases, will be deposited, and they will not be vulnerable to um, a lot of the pesticide applications. The nymphs are the overwintering stage, um, and then uh, actually the adults tend to die off as it starts to get cool. So the reason you may see cockroaches during the summer is um, even though they're present all year long is because as they get bigger, they have wider foraging ranges. So they will venture further away from that water meter box or whatever, wherever it is they were born. Um, and then also uh, they require uh, warmth. So they're nocturnal and they're only really gonna be walking around if it's you know, above 55 or even 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So that only really happens with regularity in the summer. So here's a group of nymphs overwintering, and you can see they're kind of huddled against this electrical wire for uh, the warmth, the ambient warmth associated with that electricity. So this is the stage you would find if you were popping open water meter boxes or utility boxes in December and January. Uh, we also have um, in California, American cockroaches. And so these guys can also be considered peridomestic, but they live in underground infrastructure. So they need a lot of warmth and humidity. They're typically found in sewers, storm drain systems, um, but they will venture up to the surface when it's warm. So the photo on the left was taken in Fresno uh, back in April, but we had a, a warm spell and there were uh, American cockroaches coming out of basically damaged infrastructure that allowed them to reach the surface and uh, they feed on all kinds of things. In this image, they're feeding on um, a squished fig. So what do we do about these cockroaches? The number one way to reduce the population is to reduce moisture around your home. Um, if you have a lot of moisture, that's great for cockroaches. They're going to survive better during the summer. They're going to find more things that they can eat. Uh, so if we can reduce moisture, especially within a couple meters of the uh, perimeter of the home or structure, we're going to uh, do a lot for cockroach prevention. We want to try to remove as much food as possible from around the home as well. So you never wanna leave pet food outside. Of course, that's gonna attract rats and wildlife as well, but cockroaches will feed on pet food. If you have a fruit tree, make sure that fruit is not accumulating in the landscape. Uh, there's a neighbor who has a loquat tree and I can always go over there and collect cockroaches on a warm night. Uh, I'm talking dozens of cockroaches underneath that tree and it's all squished fruit right now. Also, you want to make sure your structural envelope or perimeter is well sealed. 
So since these guys are primarily getting in through exterior doors, door sweeps or door brushes are very effective at keeping them out. Garages should be sealed with uh, flexible threshold seals. So pavement underneath, you know, the, the garage door, the driveway basically can shift or crack and it's difficult over time to maintain a good seal there. So there are materials that can be used to seal that up. Uh, and then of course, window screens should be intact. We also want to consider filling crevices in the landscape. So the lower right shows um, a masonry wall, which had an, uh, a joint that was rotted out. So there you've got a one or two inch gap that allows cockroaches to hide, it stays moist and protected, and that's where they're gonna breed. So um, in this example, we filled that uh, with an appropriate sealant. If you decide to treat for cockroaches, uh, keep in mind, it really may not be necessary. The problem with these guys is they get inside. To some degree, it's okay if we have these outside. They're not causing harm. They're actually cleaning up uh, dead stuff in the environment. Um, they're part of the ecosystem out there. We just wanna keep them outside. So pesticide applications may not be necessary and they may not fix the problem. If you have exterior doors with a one inch gap, it doesn't matter how many pesticides you apply, the cockroaches are still going to come in through that door. So perimeter sprays are generally not very effective against cockroaches. Um, you also may want to communicate with neighbors uh, and see if there are ways that you can modify the landscape or the community to make it less cockroach friendly. If you're having a problem with storm drains or maybe um, uh, damaged sewer infrastructure, public agencies should be involved. There are ways that they can repair or modify those assets so that the cockroaches cannot get out. Um, and sometimes they actually will treat for these cockroaches, especially the American cockroaches when the populations are too high. If you do want to use insecticides for cockroaches, whether they're inside domestic or outside peridomestic, bait works best. There are lots of different formulations. We've done research uh, with gel baits, with granular baits, and they're all very effective. The way that these things work is um, they have secondary and tertiary mortality because cockroaches are cannibalistic. So you're looking at a male Turkestan cockroach who has become trapped on a sticky card and his buddies were able to reach him because he's at the edge of the card and they ate him. So if he had an insecticide bait within his body, he imparts a secondary dose to his buddies that cannibalize him. And when they die, they can actually impart a tertiary dose to even more cockroaches. So you can use bait to eradicate a very large cockroach population without any sprays at all. Okay, let's get to another topic here, ant invasions. So ants are exceedingly common in California landscapes. What you're looking at here is a foraging trail, very large foraging trail of Argentine ants. So Argentine ants will form these humongous foraging trails that are multiple ants wide. You know, many other species, you're only going to see ants in single file um, as they move from nest to resource. But these Argentine ants, the colonies are humongous. They're all connected and um, they respond to resources in mass. Um, so, of course, with ants, you always want to prevent access. You want to prevent um, the resources that they want, water and food. Um, but there are certain times of the year that no matter what you do, you may get ant invasions just due to the weather being inhospitable outside. So there's a great paper out there. We're going to send you a link um, published by Stanford uh, entomologists in 2001. And they identify two periods of the year where in California, this is specific to Northern California, but I think it also applies to parts of the Valley and Southern California. There are two periods of the year 
where Argentine ants are most likely to enter your home, whether there are resources present or not. Cold wet conditions, usually the first big rain, and that's because the soil will flood and their nest may actually flood, but there's a smaller period, a uh, smaller peak, I should say, in the summertime. When it gets hot and dry, it becomes so inhospitable to these Argentine ants that really need water and moderate temperatures that they will move inside. Sometimes they will even move uh, part of their nest or um, uh, you know, maybe even an entire brood into a protected area indoors, you know, within a wall void, uh, a, um, a cabinet void, um, somewhere that they can access easily from outside. Just like the peridomestic cockroaches, Argentine ants live and breed outside. If you're seeing them indoors, it's because they're foraging on a resource there or they're temporarily moving their colony in there to avoid inhospitable conditions. So what do we do about it? Well, actually, first, I wanted to show you another video. This was taken um, over the winter. And what you're looking at is a truck door. Um, it's actually a government truck, but this truck was parked on top of an ant colony during a flood. So this is not relevant during the summer, but I thought it was a cool thing to show you is it's not just homes that get invaded, it's anything that helps the ants to avoid the inhospitable conditions. So what do we do? Remember with IPM, we always wanna focus on prevention. We can reduce moisture around the home, same as with the cockroaches. Argentine ants are very uh, reliant upon supplemental water, irrigation. So if you have a succulent landscape like I do, where I don't water at all during the summer um, or rarely, you're not gonna have Argentine ants. I have lots of native ant species around my home. I don't have any Argentine ants, even though I can go a couple homes away down the street and find an irrigated landscape covered with Argentine ants. So that's one thing you can do right away is try to move towards more of a drought tolerant or zero escape landscape. Um, and a lot of people use drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is very attractive to Argentine ants. So I'm talking about no moisture or reduced moisture, not just drip irrigation. Uh, you can also try to control sap sucking insects. So these are things like aphids, mealybug, whitefly, soft scale insects that are sucking out plant juices and um, you know, excreting the excess as very sugary uh, um, waste. And so the ants feed on this honeydew, you know, this excretion, and they also will protect these sap sucking insects from their natural enemies. So um, if you're able to uh, control the sap sucking insects, you'll control the ants. Likewise, if you um, are controlling ants, you will probably see a reduction in aphids or mealybugs. Just like with the cockroaches, we want to remove uh, other resources like pet foods, fallen fruit, um, anything that ants uh, might be able to eat. This is exceedingly difficult with ants because um, there's a lot of things that they can accept as food. Uh, and they also will prey on lots of other insects that are present. So there's only so much you can do, but um, you know, prevention uh, should at least be considered. Okay, you might be tempted to use pesticides for ant invasions. Again, it may not be necessary. The conditions outside are uh, what may be driving the invasion rather than um, resource foraging, you know? That's not always true. Sometimes you have water or food available that's very attractive almost any time of the year. But there are some times of the year when it doesn't matter if you have resources inside or not, they're gonna come in because they don't like the conditions outside. So it may not be necessary to treat, it may not be effective to treat. You really want to avoid regular pesticide spray programs around the perimeter of a home. The reason is because these materials can run off into our surface water systems, urban creeks, storm drain systems, 
and they kill the arthropods there, which includes little crustaceans that form, uh, you know, really the 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 foundation of the food web in these aquatic ecosystems. And so um, most of the most of the year, these insecticide applications are not going to do much uh, for ants. Um, there are some very effective uh, materials that are out there and they're professional materials. So I would say that if you are experiencing uh, chronic ant issues, um, you wanna talk to professionals. They have um, barrier insecticides as well as professional baits that can be used to try to uh, deal with that situation. So I, I mentioned baits. Uh, baits work um, for ants uh, just as well as they do for cockroaches but in a different way. So um, ants are not cannibalistic in the same way that the cockroaches are, but they share food. So ants are social insects. So if an ant consumes um, a bit of insecticidal bait, it's gonna share that with its nest mates, with its buddies. And sometimes if it's the right formulation with the developing larvae, you know, the juvenile ants in the nest. So with bait, you can actually kill an entire ant colony, where with sprays, at best, you're going to kill the ants that cross that barrier, uh, or sometimes you'll repel the ants. You're not killing the colony. So um, this takes time. If you're baiting, you're not going to see results right away. And there's a great resource out there uh, from the state that educates on the need to bait and wait for ant management. So sometimes you will have what's called an ant emergency. So you come home uh, or all of a sudden you notice you got ants everywhere. And so there are some steps that you can follow uh, to try to you know, deal with that emergent situation. Uh, first, if they are responding to a food or water source, you want to remove that right away or clean it up if possible. You can vacuum ants. But what I like to do is wipe them up with soapy water. So at my home, I actually keep a spray bottle with 10% um, soap solution and I'll spray it uh, whenever I see ants. And you can wipe up the ants, which will be killed by that uh, kind of surface um, contact insecticide. But you will also erase the pheromone trail that the ants are using to find the resource and find. The way back to their nest. You can try to locate the entry points and plug those up, uh, but it's it's difficult to do that. Um, you also should try to use the correct sealant so that you don't damage any of the furnishings in your home. And then finally, if uh, you've done these things, um, you do want to consider bait if you're still having an ant problem and give the baits time uh, to work. Okay, so back to this paper, I wanted to highlight another um, quote or another statement that I found in this paper. And um, basically the, the authors are explaining that um, uh, pesticides are not always effective and um, the conditions outside are driving the infestation. So, um, if you wait a little bit, conditions will change. And that's where you're most likely to see control is just wait for the conditions to change. So we've been talking about this already, but this research backs it up. Um, the ants are in there because of inhospitable conditions. So no matter what you do with pesticides, uh, they, they may still be coming in. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some other common summertime pests, uh, flies generally, but what I have uh, pictured here is called a blowfly, Califorid. Califoridae is the family. And so these uh, flies are very common in the warmer parts of California. They're usually a metallic green, and you notice the adults. But with flies, you have to think about the larvae. Where are the maggots developing? And in the case of blowflies, they really like pet waste, so dog poop. So a great way to prevent those fly problems during your barbecue, or maybe you left a door open, 
um, and you're cooking inside, before you know it, you're going to have dozens of flies all over the home, is make sure if you have pets um, or when you're walking your pet, pick up the waste, get rid of the waste. Uh, you know, just one deposit of pet waste can uh, sustain a lot of these flies. So uh, that goes a long way. It can be a community-wide effort. The problem is flies can fly. So you may still have issues if your neighbor or somebody down the street uh, has a lot of pet waste, they're gonna be developing flies back there and the flies may be attracted to your home. So that's where we talk about structural exclusion, window screens, keep your doors closed uh, or use uh, really good fitting screen doors if you wanna have your doors open during the summertime. Another one to talk about, spiders. And spiders are uh, usually considered beneficial because they're predators, they're eating things like flies. But in the summertime, you will start to notice spiders more and more. So they're reproducing faster, uh, but also we don't have rain washing away the webs. The webs may also collect debris. So you may notice them for the first time in the summertime. You may be tempted to contract with pest control for a spider treatment, but consider a spider brush treatment. So the te technician on the right here is using a spider brush, which is just an extendable brush, which is used to physically remove spiders and their brushes, not or and their webs, I'm sorry, non-chemically. So very effective. And if your goal is to get rid of the webbing on the exterior of the home, uh, they work very well. If you don't want spiders inside, we're back to exclusion. Put the door sweeps in, put the screens on, and you should have minimal problems with spiders this year. Yellow jackets. Uh, so here's another video for you. Uh, yellow jackets are social wasps, and their numbers increase dramatically during the summer. They are attracted to human food as well as uh, um, resources in the environment. So the video on the right, we see a lot of fallen fruit, which is attractive to yellow jackets, but also there's a, uh, a tree stump or root, which has a cavity. And so our native yellow jackets actually nest in these subterranean cavities. So just what I would say about yellow jackets is just be aware that they're out there. When you're picnicking, uh, you know, try um, not to have open containers of sugary liquids, you're more likely to get stung on the lip, you know? So uh, lids and straws will help if you're out there drinking a soda in the state park, uh, for instance. Um, there are traps that can be used to reduce the numbers of yellow jackets around a picnic area, for instance. But if you see a nest like this, you may be able to get a free treatment or even nest removal from your vector control agency. There are sometimes county specific or regional vector control groups that will come out and make nest treatments to areas like this because these are stinging pests. They're attracted to human foods and they will sting you. Um, in my opinion, the sting is less painful than that of a honeybee, uh, but some people are allergic. So it can be considered a public health pest you will start to notice these guys pretty soon here um, as we get warmer. Okay, so hopefully everyone listening in is familiar with the UCIPM website, uh, the most widely accessed source of pest management information in the world. So I invite you to explore it, get to know it, uh, bookmark it, make it a, fa a favorite website of yours. Lots and lots of resources in there. We have our uh, primary long form resource called the Pest Notes. And so these guidelines will provide information about biology, ecology, prevention, management, identification. So check it out. I'm just uh, showing what the cockroach pest note looks like, part of the flies pest note. And some of these have, um, special elements that will help you get a little further in your diagnosis and management, such as the key 
to identifying common ants. Um, and that can be helpful because different ant species eat different things and can be managed in different ways. You can also download these as PDFs, print them out, share them with your neighbors. Let's say you have a neighborhood problem with Turkestan cockroaches. Um, this could be part of the communication process uh, as you guys discuss what you're going to do. There are also lots of videos that can help educate you and perhaps your community members. Um, this one is uh, one of our YouTube videos about identifying yellow jackets and distinguishing them from other similar insects. Finally, I want to remind you that you have a UC Cooperative Extension Master Gardener program in your county. These volunteers are trained by UC academics like myself to uh, diagnose pest problems and provide information about management. Um, they are not gonna tell you what to do, but they will give you the information that you need to make the best decision for your pest situation. So please reach out and get to know your county's master gardeners. They are excellent people, very smart and very prepared to help. So that's what I have for you guys today. Um, my contact information is freely given, freely available. Please email me, please text me, please call me. Um, I would love to talk to you about your pest problems. I don't work for the residential public, but I promise I will get you in touch with the right resource. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew, for that great presentation.